Well, welcome everyone to this, the third webinar in our Sadler series, Telling Operatic Stories. And this session is entitled Invitations and Collaborations, Exploring Ethical and Artistic Encounters in Opera. Um, as with previous webinars, the event is being recorded and streamed on YouTube. And you are strongly encouraged as audience members to participate via chat. Um, we have hopefully enabled cameras this time. So please do post any questions you have in the chat and we will invite you to either verbally ask your question or we can respond to the question in the chat. So please maybe when you use the chat function indicate if you would like to um, speak on screen. Okay. In our last session, the British composer and sitarist Jasdeep Singh Degun spoke of his experiences of being invited to nominally cross-cultural projects in which Indian classical musical traditions and performers were treated, in his view, as tokenistic. These negative experiences shaped his own approach to the music of Orpheus in Opera North's recent production, which from its conception through workshopping and rehearsals and through to its final staging sought always to situate the encounters between Monteverdi and by extension the Western operatic tradition with Indian classical tradition on a more equal, respectful and ethical footing. Indeed, it's the process rather than the final product that was central to Jasdeep's approach, the ways in which he brought together not just different musical traditions, but also different administrative and learning practices were central to his vision. These ambitions were not without his challenges. Jasdeep asked, how do you get a company that have traditionally done things for hundreds of years in a certain manner? How do you get them to change track, especially when bringing in people from outside of the tradition, outside of the genre? And when discussing, say, the practical difficulties of getting an opera company to perform something without a score in the way that he would like, Jasdeep went on to say, and I quote, you make the same point five times to five different people who all get it, but just can't change a thing. Can't people just listen to me? And it's really about listening and the ethics of listening that we move to this session. And we look to move beyond Orpheus, which we've discussed in detail in previous webinars, and indeed, perhaps this week, beyond Opera North and quite possibly beyond Opera, in order to consider the dynamics and issues at stake in artistic collaborations. We want to consider how organizations and artists work meaningfully with communities and practitioners from outside of their traditions to consider the implications of what it means to invite such communities and practitioners to collaborate? What makes such an encounter ethical? And how might we create spaces, physical or virtual, to enable such encounters? In order to help us prize apart and discuss these questions, we're delighted to welcome Erilyn Wallen, a composer whose music has won many awards and received great critical acclaim. Erilyn was the first black woman to have a work featured at the proms. She founded Ensemble X, whose uh, mission statement really is, we don't break down barriers in music. We don't see any. Erilyn's 22 operas include last year's Dido's Ghost and 2018's The Powder Monkey, which was written in partnership with Opera North and the National Maritime Museum. Her most recent opera, The Paradise Files, tells the story of the 18th century blind pianist and composer Maria Theresa von Paradis, and performances of this opera bring together British Sign Language, captioning and audio description. We're also delighted to welcome Dr. Romy Smith, a poet, playwright, theatre maker, performer, librettist and scholar. Romy has had residences and commissions from institutions including the British Council and the BBC, and has over 25 years experience working in diverse community, educational, academic and mental health settings. Amongst her creative work, we might single out Romy's The Rain Is Coming, a reworking of Schubert's Die Schöne Mullerin with the composer Emily Levi and performed by Roderick Williams and Susie Allen. And in this reworking, voice is given to the maid of the original cycle. And these vital questions of who gets to speak, who gets to perform, a threaded tooth throughout her wonderful recent essay on Vaughan Williams's The Lark Ascending, 
and Belonging, which was broadcast on BBC Radio 3's The Essay, and it's currently available on BBC Sounds, and I do ask you all to check it out afterwards. Anyway, Erilyn, Romy, thank you so much. Um, Erilyn, if I might turn to you to begin with, um, can you talk or briefly introduce um, some of the experiences you've had in collaborating um, in your own work? Well, um, in the last year, I realized I'd, com I'd composed three operas um, in the same year. And after that, I said, right, no more operas. <laughs> but the thing that draws me back time and time again is that I actually feel duty bound to tell the stories of our time, uh, and like Rami, to to give voice, um, sort of to get our opera just out of its uh, museum culture, where where the lens is focused on just a really quite a narrow tradition. Um, so I get hauled back into opera. That's why I've written twenty two so far. And um, what I love about the form is that uh, both composing on a small scale to large scale. Um, you can really get to the heart of a, a dramatic exploration in a way that I can't do anywhere else. You know, so when the moment you combine them, the music and the text and different groups of people. Um, so, for example, my my recent opera is something uh, I've been wanting to tell a long time, set in 18th century London, uh, adapting a novel from um, S.I. Martin, which, which exp shows quite clearly uh, the... The, the, the black presence in London in the 18th century and um, the intersection with uh, um, recently freed American slaves. And it's incredible that story hasn't ever been put on stage. So um, I enjoy the struggle. It's, 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 I find there are times with the larger institutions, they, they often don't see the wood for the trees, which is the upper, the operatic form is about exploring stories and telling them in a way um, that you just can't another way and that that things have moved on so much since um, since the 17th century because of the richness of cultures we have and which we all you know we all are part part of so that's that's a bit of a gloss I haven't gone into individual details but that but the form I, I call it up for because I understand what what that is often I've worked in teams where fairly recently, you know, the writers don't actually, some writers don't actually involve, don't understand what's involved in the whole process. Um, that, you know, that can happen, but the process does change from work to work. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I think certainly much to unpack there. I think uh, the way yes. in which the forms and traditions of larger institutions can act as a constraint on the types of stories and the nature of storytelling is something we'll certainly return to. But if I might quickly, I uh, might turn now to Romy briefly. Can you give an introduction to your own experiences and um, positioning within this conversation? Sure, and, and thank you, Erilyn, for that sort of setting out of the relationship between the individual and the institution and the ways in which perhaps the institution can somehow overlook the metaphors of collaboration, its significance, and particularly in the craft of politicised storytelling as in and telling the stories that have been marginalised and recentering or centering those stories. And, and I absolutely, um, that resonates so much with me. Um, collaboration, I've written about this both in a chapter published in a book called Imagining Queer Methods, which was published um, in 2019 by New York University Press, and in an up and coming um, book, which is called Queer Sharing in the Marketized University, um, which is, looks at the redistribution of resources within the academy. I look at the politics of collaboration and I describe collaboration as praxis. Oh, I talk about the ways in which um, it's about an embodied experiential knowledge that collaboration gives me upon from which I theorise. And absolutely central to that is the idea of collaboration, not only as a method in and of itself, and it's fundamental to my work. I work in collaboration with musicians. Um, 
all the time. I've literally come from a rehearsal to this with a um, mus musician collaborator. Um, so it's it's my method and it's about electricity within a space, about energies within a space. It's about dynamics within a space. It's also about other things too, particularly within a context as I've written about of um, perhaps institutional oppressions that we might be aware of, um, depending on who we are. Collaboration functions for me as insulation. I mean, I looked at collaboration as company within my thesis and the ways in which collaboration affords a being seen, a being heard, perhaps as a counter to other experiences of not being seen or not being heard or not being visible. So me, collaboration was protection. It was collaboration was a community and the curation of a community um, of, alongside principles for me of radical generosity. Um, and and all those, uh, I, what I'm wanting to reach towards are metaphors around spark and fire and energy. That's what I from collaborate is that many heads are better than one and I love what happens when perhaps I might start off with an idea but I go into um, community with other artists and it changes shape it changes direction that energy that's the magic of collaboration but then secondly it's also um, my methodology so it's the rationale for my choice of methods and it's the methodology because of those experiences that I have had too many times in my lifetime of being marginalized of being overlooked of feeling that the stories that I wish to tell are decentered and not considered important in whatever way um and and that's about a, a sustained experience of discrimination so the politic of collaboration without a doubt for me is about a refusal and a protest in terms of discrimination it's a way to speak back and it's the way and again, I'm sort of pretty much quoting from what I write. Collaboration for me functions as a strategy against the divisionism of discrimination, which seeks to isolate people and people feel as though they are alone with an experience. For me, it's a radical counter to that. Thank you so much for that, um, Romy. Um, so much food for thought there. Um, the way in which both of you have framed this, drawing these ideas together, is often um, in terms of a community of often shared artistic goals and ideals, um, but butting up at times against um, the constraints of institutions, the constraints of um, social and cultural embedded norms. Um, and I'm sure over the next hour, we're going to be digging into this deeper. But if I could just expand the community slightly and ask how these types of interactions, these types of strategies and frameworks operate when working with um, so, for instance, um, mental health groups, I know, um, Rami, you've worked with them, or um, blind, uh, the Vision Institute as part of the Parodies Files. How, how do these interactions operate when you're working with external partners? For example, can I just jump in? Um, one of my earliest, um, as a student, when I was studying for a master's, um, I worked a lot in care homes and that opened that that in a way was the most informative thing for me uh, to realize how music can have such an impact on that, that basically one takes you go to where people are and and I think particularly working on the, the opera with Grey Eye that was that was a such a journey for us all because I was working with a company that had never actually put an opera on before and and so together we had to work to make something which actually never done before. I, I've never seen an opera that looks like that, where, uh, you know, Gray are just top of the field in knowing all the technique and expertise of, of what true access is in, in, in a theatre. So to, so together we had to really figure out, and some it wasn't always easy. Um, and I found myself sometimes being really conservative, saying um, we have to retain this part um, 
of what we're doing because this is to me that is what opera is you know what I mean so where access and then the you know busted up against the form of opera which you could say on surface detail is unintelligible in many ways do you see what I mean so that whole idea of access I had to think about that um within the form you know across time in a way and that was that was quite tremendous um and it also showed me how for music theatre forms to move forward, there was often that moment of crunch where you suddenly realise everybody's holding on to something, but to make something new, you have to sort of push beyond that pain barrier. And that's where the team is so important, the team and this idea of trust. W without it, there's no, uh, the, the, there's no real endeavour that can um, be truly... Um, I, I don't like that word authentic, but truly itself or that can truly uh, reach its potential without that trust. So just to pick up on that notion of form um, and the ways in which these type of encounters and interactions lend themselves to a rethinking of the form from within, is this um a common experience that you have both found in these types of uh collaborative endeavors particularly when engaging with the types of stories and the types of experiences that aren't typically um represented within the genres in which you work yes do you want to answer that Rami? yeah i mean i think i think fundamental to to collaboration and genuine collaboration and, and collaboration that's based on I agree with Erilyn totally trust is fundamental I, I'm thinking here about the scholar um, Adrienne Marie Brown who uh, looks at activism um, and, and community contexts and love this and I carry this like a phrase like a, a mantra with me she says move at the speed of trust move at the speed of trust in terms of community activism or community work and I carry that with me in terms of not only the mental health work that I do so I've been a practitioner working in mental health context for the last 25 years to use creative writing as a tool for positive mental health and well-being I work in a perinatal unit I'm an NHS writer in residence over the last 10 years I've worked with women who are experiencing pre and postnatal depression and I see firsthand the ways in which uh, being in um community together um in communion together I would even argue and um finding roots to express oneself through the arts I think I again agree with what Erilyn said at the top about um music and the power of music and I think language is also a music and uh or words are a, are a music and when you are with people who find that um, way of doing that it's utterly transformative it utterly changes things and you see how uh, the power of that and the self-empowerment of that it is all about moving at the speed of trust but in terms of genuine I just want to kind of go back to this idea of sort of particularly classical um, institutions orga organizations working with communities and the notions of ethics around that because I know that that's obviously within the kind of brief of the sort of um, conveners of, of this talk I think so often when I see it perhaps not being done well it's when it's there's a short termism applied or it's a kind of just for special occasions so everything being boxed into say Black History Month for instance you know these stories exist they're global and they exist for 11 other months of the year and I understand the politics of Black History Month I understand its necessity but the problem is when the programmers and the decision makers decide to overwhelm or overload a month with one particular type of story and imply that the other 11 months the story doesn't matter and that the disingenuity I think of um of collaboration when when that happens and I wrote down some words actually they're all words beginning with C that feel for me fundamental to collaboration and genuine collaboration they are care and I associate that with um Erilyn's contribution to trust 
and genuine care with a capital C, community, as in what does that mean to be in community? And, and that means hearing cacophonous or voices that don't say what it is you want to hear. So uh, can you embrace the voices that are telling stories that you don't want to hear in a process? Because I've seen often the disingenuity be when somebody speaks up and pipes up and says something that's not what the conveners of a space want to hear. That voice is in silence, got rid of. And then consistency. And that doesn't mean that everything needs to be plain sailing, but it does mean that you go back and you don't see it as a one-off attempt at creating contribution. Because again, I think people can often feel dropped, you know, that they were important for her. But what happens to in terms of the ongoingness? And then the other word I have down is constancy. And what I mean by that is again not um, it is uh, well what I mean by that is that there is it's more than once that there is a developing and ongoing relationship that is being built because again where I see diversity practices within artistic contexts occur when it's not happening well is when people feel exploited and taken from and as and used and as though they were important for a moment and and also you know often those moments where we talk about community consultation they often rely on something incredibly important that doesn't begin with a c it begins with a v and it's the volunteer it relies very heavily on people to give unpaid feedback to an organization or institution and so i wonder in terms of a politics of generosity what if we see those people as what they are, which is another c consultants that's what they are they're consultants they're community consultants so it's about value and placing value on embodied body experience on experiential knowledge that those people are giving and understanding and communicating their value not thinking we can grab and go Very well put. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, I was just uh, making notes there. Um, so the things that you have outlined there, um, Romy, I think around care and community, consistency, constancy, it demands of institutions and artists and external partners a huge investment of time. And, um, and I and the point that you make that the way in which volunteers should be seen not as volunteers but as consultants and re rewarded for their time um reimbursed for their time is um entirely right um so how do how do institutions how do organizations begin to facilitate this uh, i'm thinking particularly in the light of the terrible Arts Council England funding and the ways in which organisations are increasingly um, under the cost. How, how, how can we move towards more sustainable ethical encounters within the arts? Gosh, yes, I've been thinking a lot about this lately and how some of the larger institutions <laughs> Um, you know, who um, they they might talk about outreach and bringing in new audiences, but I've noticed they don't pay so much attention to uh, who they're commissioning to make these works. It's all about, um, you know, the, the huge budgets go to a certain... It sounds... I've, I've just noticed it because I've, I often compare say um our nation's opera houses say to theater companies where there's a much wider range of contemporary and recent works being commissioned by a wide variety of people and that's to me is nearly 100 percent absent from the commissioning of the large so i think that's got to be addressed and so um i personally feel the future of a lot of i say music theaters in the smaller companies companies like um to name names, Tete Tete, who've been doing groundbreaking work for decades in actually developing the form. So I just think it's look, you can't get around looking at the form and what we want from it and who we want 
who, whose voices we want to hear in the actual creation of these new works, because new work is the is it's that that's going to ensure the future of the form that we care about so much. Thank you. Romy, do you have a thought on that? Um, I mean, I agree is uh, what I would say, first of all. And I think I want to sort of, for me, add and sort of uh, add additional things to the discussion that we're having, which is to think about sort of this as being a discussion about the politics of space when we talk about um, collaboration, genuine collaboration, community, the engagement, and talking about classical, the kind of classical genre. I know that might be problematic phrase but but it's the best one that I can reach for at the moment and if we think about that I often think it's a politics of space and a politics that which I explore in the essay that I wrote for Radio 3 on Vaughan Williams the Lark Ascending I I ask the question who owns the Lark and I particularly focus in on a particular performance of the Lark Ascending by the musician and scholar Ty Murray at the proms uh, the first black woman in history to play the Lark Ascending at the proms, so I might add. Um, it's been being performed at the prom since 1934. And she was the first black woman. And it it received, I mean, the crowds were jubilant inside um, the Albert Hall, but online I explore the fact that it received some racist uh, vitriol and I unpack that in the essay and talk about the politics of who you know the metaphors of belonging who does the lark belong to and I think um, that notion of belonging and that notion of the politics of space and ownership is very important here when we come to talk about ethics and um, classical music or music in general but specifically I think classical music which is often cast and recast certainly in this century and I'd love your perspective on this, Erilyn, um, is white. Um, the, the, uh, I think that um, there was something that happened at the Royal Opera House, I think, last night concerning a young musician who performed and received um, heckling from... Now, I, I'd want more details, but I'm asking already, there are some questions I'm asking, like a Rolodex in my own head about whether that was a raced experience or that again and somehow a commentary on that child being perceived not to belong to that space um, and I think until we can foster a culture of belonging so that people are not made to feel like they're guests in those spaces that they are um, I think often so much uh, prejudice and discrimination often manifests in my experience as practices of unwelcome that's the best way I can describe it you know that you're being you know the amount of times I've walked into spaces and someone I dress in black quite a lot and uh, where someone's assumed that I'm the cleaner or I'm here to deliver the sandwiches has happened before so I get asked questions around that but they don't expect that I'm um uh, as an academic they don't they, or whatever it is that I'm there to do give a presentation usually they don't expect that I am that and that presumption is the gap um and in between that gap are words like unbelonging presumption assumption a discrimination and I think until we can reconcile that and then until we can unpack that then then it will always feel as though some of what is happening feels like it's just for special occasions it's just for this month and it's back to what I said earlier and, and uh, some other notes that I have down so broader than the actual performance of something genuine collaboration is thinking about how everything that is happening that has led to that moment um a bit like a massive mind map links to that moment of performance so it's about who the artistic director is who are the funders who are the people writing up this event who get to archive it who are the people reviewing this event um too often in cases that purport to be about collaboration and change and change in a sphere of sort of particularly race and ethics actually they're not when you unpack them they're not doing that at all they're doing something else and it feels as though 
And again, I've written about this, which is the politics of the ways in which colonial language is resurrects itself within um, the academy. Take that. Uh, as a starting point, but I think it's the case within wider institutions. So the amount of times I, I will, you know, particularly within the case of stories that are marginalised and have been decentered by a supremacy cultures, um, I will often hear the and uh, the academic who is crediting themselves with um, raising awareness of that particular story, talk about having discovered it. You know, it feels very much like a kind of colonial language, a bit like somebody discovering um, land. And I think so often within academia, what can happen is that there can be, you mentioned a point, Ed, at the top where you said, it takes a lot of time to cultivate a relationship with volunteers. And I would say, yes, I think that's true, but it also, whose time is worth more? <laughs> and if we're genuinely wanting to cultivate a relationship, I would say, actually, it costs a lot and takes time to volunteer and to volunteer your ideas. And um, that's what I mean about transforming the word from volunteer or community engagement to consultant, community consultant, because I think the value system becomes different then when we do that. So I think what I'm trying to say in a long roundabout way is collaboration is about constant reflection of over power dynamics and who has power within that power dynamic, and particularly when you're coming as an institutional tenured collaborator, is to really look at the politics of that, how you're perceived to people who don't have necessarily as much fiscal power as you, do not have the institutional power that you have. What's your relationship dynamic? And it's to check that. Uh, and it's not to say that it, it shouldn't be there. It is the necessity of the fact that somebody is attached to an institution. But I think if there was more awareness of how that plays out in the dynamic in terms of power and a rethinking about how that can be um, challenged in a relational dynamic, then I think that uh, collaborations would have more integrity. Thank you so much. I've just, I've got questions galore, but I am aware. I have asked questions galore, and I just want to offer, Lucien was... Yes, yep. I, I just have our questions about uh, language barriers, and uh, um, Romeo said the language barrier is a challenge during the creation, and I'm wondering, um, do you worry about uh, the language barrier brings us uh, some misunderstanding or like the um um uh, or you can just like explain a little bit more about the challenges about the language barriers bring to the creations yeah because i think it, uh, through the volunteers you can understand but uh, the volunteers cannot tell you the culture so you should learn the culture or the know about the locals through your experiences or how do you how do you cover this challenge can you talk about uh can you talk a little bit more about that Marilyn, would you like to respond first well, I, I understood, Rami, you to mean language as the language of the art form, or, or did you mean specifically language as in? Oh, I meant the language of, when I referenced language, I was talking about music being a language, but I yes. was asking, yes. arguing the case that um, words are their own music. Um, so I was trying to draw a parallel between the languages of music and, and words. Yes. That's what I meant. But I'll, I mean, I'll, in terms of language uh, barriers, I mean, for sure, if, please correct me if I'm, I'm not answering the question that you would like me to. Um, but I feel that, yes, there is, a, again, back to that word I used about the colonial kind of aesthetic that often encompass a uh, company's inquiry you know, we are speaking in English here. Um, I wonder what it looks like to be in a space where other languages are 
did it in translation, the po politics and power of translation. I was at an event the other night where for the first time in ages, I saw a signer, a deaf signer. And I thought, yeah, absolutely. It's like, again, the presumption that language is about audibility and the language is about English, or, or yes, speaking English. I absolutely think that we need to, in terms of inclusivity, pay attention to uh, other languages. It should not be the case that English is um, the primary and only language. And I say that, unfortunately, as somebody who, for whom English is my only language. Um, and I and I thought about that in my adulthood about in, the fact that English is my only language, and and the power of that and what that means. But certainly for sure in an artistic context, you know, I think that the best of the community engagement work that I have seen in all kinds of contexts are when those kinds of attention to detail or that kind of attention to detail is present. If I might just follow that um so you were talking earlier about the spaces in which these collaborations take place and i guess one of the corollaries of this is that the spaces in which collaborations occur have their own dominant languages and that can confer particular identities on people as part of that so even in the simplest form of host and guest and the expectations there but also I'm thinking perhaps um, Erilyn in a work like The Powder Monkey where um, you draw um, if I remember rightly on Indian and African musical traditions and incorporate those languages in a work that is presented and received within a particular space um, yes. uh, a stage in London so so how do space? Uh, how, in your experiences, have spaces formulated and constrained or problematized language in this collaborative sense? Um, I was, you know, proud example is a good example uh, of a work where all of us had to just. I was drawing from uh, music which has an oral, oral tradition. So actually, the first point is. Um, and workshops were with Jazz Deep, who in fact I mentored him early on in his, you know, he was writing a string quartet, but wanted to combine uh, the Western and Indian together. And so we developed a really good friendship. And in this work of mine, I, I had Cora and I had Sitar and Djembe. And the fact of the matter, these, these are, this is, you know, centuries and centuries long, older, older traditions than the Western classical tradition. And so I had to find a way in of notating and find a way of working with musicians very directly so that we could use a combination of Western notation, but also improvisation, but also really fixed points in the music of things that, that we needed to hear very precisely. And, and I, I find I seem to do that with a lot of my operas. Even Dada's Ghost has, you know, I use electric bass guitar and Percussion instruments that don't actually North African all combined with Baroque uh, period instruments. I like that. Um, I like bringing those things together, and so that means the whole performance. Um, we have to find a way of incorporating. You know what might seem on the paper to conduct like a huge problem. You know by the end of it, um, you know Dunedin Ensemble say, "Oh, why can't we always have an electric bass guitar?" <laughs> because actually it works. But it's like you have to find the, you know, the language of the form, and then, you know, the language of, say, in the case of um, the Grey Art for Parodies Files, how do we, you know, we we had the most incredible signers. And actually, we didn't have, and we had surtitles, which in themselves were were like little films as well as a um, lot of people on stage creating what was in a sense a new choreography for opera. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's I, I always feel um, to open up the form to things and and you, you, you know, I've often made mistakes, but you, I carry on those problems to the next thing. I think how can we bring often the, you know, vernacular in with this, 
this very arch, often quite stultified language. Can I comment back? Would that be okay? So, um, yeah, Erilyn, as you were talking, I mean, one of the things that I think feels, and, and just that description um, of, of your work, uh, what I hear is that, that we you are crossing borders all the time in the ways in which you curate um, the parts of a piece of work and and that feels like those crisscrossings those moving across borders feel um so important and they feel politically so important as well as artistically so important because it it pushes it, it i think i think one of the things that feels so important about it is that we live in a society which wants borders quite literally um we live in a west that desires borders and to keep people out so much of what i'm hearing you describe is a practice and a politic of bringing things in what happens if we put the cora and the sitar uh, together um what does that sound like and let's um, embrace that music um, yeah. And the, the thing about it is, for me, the starting point has to be, I'm doing this so that we can tell the story correctly, rather than, oh, I'm just going to put these incidents together. So, like, for example, in Dido's Ghost, where Henry Purcell, Dido and these, folds into my opera, from the outset, I said to the Barbican, Dido has to be black. And, um, and uh, the commission said, oh, my gosh. I hadn't thought about it, of course, Dido's black, but just because we're so used to seeing Dido not black in productions, but she's a, she's an African woman. If I might just jump in there, Ed, sorry. I just thought that, um, Arilyn, some of the things you've been talking about at least point towards one of the ideas um, sort of behind this seminar, which is kind of this idea of encounter. So moving from sort of the collaboration that is the generative sort of aspect of a work to what happens actually on stage, um, either that encounter between, between artists on stage or indeed between those artists and, um, and an audience. And I just wondered if you might, um, if, you, if either of you actually ha have any thoughts on um, what makes those kinds of encounters meaningful or indeed to kind of bring in that uh, other word that sort of haunted us a little bit uh, ethical I, I, I'll just I, I'll, I'll just say something very quickly because I mean but I love what you said uh Rami, about energy and an audience will always know when that energy is operating um uh truthfully I think uh, it's that's a great point. And I think a performance or a, a project, a, a, a performance based project is never just about the experience that you have on stage. It is about everything that's led up to that point. And, and that's what can make it a joy or not is is everything that has happened dynamic wise. You know, I think back to the trust T word trust I think you can feel that yourself inside yourself when you're on stage with people you trust and you can conversely you know what that feels like when you're on stage with people you don't so then that's the important work of the director to um to curate that and and to hold that and to also hold the tensions that are a very normal part of collaboration um, and to be able to smooth those out in a way that leaves different voices heard. I think that um, you talked about ethics haunting the discussion. What well, ethics is really more than haunting it. It's on the tin. It's it's part of the, the intention, isn't it? The motivation of this kind of event is look at ethics. Uh, and therefore, I think in terms of performance work, I wrote down a, a few notes. Um, it's I've just put that all performances collaboration 
it, it has to be it's you know even if it's a solo performer it's a collaboration with the lighting technician with all the tech the stage manager the person who's cleaned the stage you know all of those people who are behind the scenes who make the performance possible are part of the collaboration seen and unseen I'm often particularly interested and I will when I go into a venue by the way um I will make a point of thanking the cleaning staff when I go, because often cleaning staff are treated so badly. Often, I notice in this, this country, again, Errol and I'd love your perspective on this, disproportionately, I often notice that cleaning staff are black uh, within institutions, both academic institutions and other types of arts institution. I notice that. And that is also another reason why I'm mindful when I go into those spaces to A, clean up after myself and B, to say thanks. Um, because I guess if you um, and, and you will know way more about this than me, but if you're a singer and you go on stage and that stage is dirty and it hasn't been swept or cleaned, you will feel that if you, there's dust in your throat and you're trying to reach those notes. So. The collaboration is integral in every single direction to what happens on stage. It couldn't happen. Theatre of any kind could not happen without that collaboration. And I think, um, yeah, I think um, that is what you acknowledge as somebody who is making creative work within performance spaces, is that everybody play a role in, in that night, in that event, seen and unseen, and needs to be acknowledged as such. And the best best of spaces will acknowledge their cleaning team yeah I mean there was one art gallery I worked with on a particular collaboration with a musician responding to the exhibits and there was a particular um image within it which was contentious um but what uh, uh what the curators did which I think was just brilliant was that they had everybody come in and have a talk tour uh, within work time of that space and that included people who were quote unquote behind the scenes from cafe bar staff to cleaning staff all came in to learn more about this exhibition to what be able to feel that they could ask questions and that for me is great that's the way that I want to see things work in terms of the collaboration and it takes time then I think we have to think about I'm thinking about the concept of slow time a lot in my practice. I've been reflecting a lot on the work of the NAP ministry. Erilyn, do you, you know the work of the NAP ministry? No, but I'd like to you... know. <laughs> yeah, I just think she, she's she's uh, wonderful. I mean, um, that ministry advocates rest for black women and particularly looks at the ways in which racialized capitalism often um, pressurizes black women to perform unpaid labor still, but black people, people of color to perform um, acts of unpaid labor. And so as protest, she advocates rest for black women. And it's really interesting to see the kinds of things that she, she posts and um so I think about that, yeah, within my own practice, the politics of rest and the politics, therefore, of what I slow time of of taking time to do things, because so much, I think, particularly within the arts, particularly given the um, pressures that the arts have been placed under that expects you to produce um, the kind of work in, in incrementally shorter amounts of time that you might 10, 15 years ago have produced with bigger and in a longer expanse of time. And that has to come out somewhere in the body. And um, that's of interest to me. So, yeah, rest, slow time. And that includes the ways in which we collaborate with others, that it's not about quickness. It's not about short termism, it's about long termism. Fascinating. <laughs> I have a curious question. So you you said it takes a long time, and usually how many I mean how many years or how many months it takes uh, during a whole creation for a, for a, for a, I mean opera or for a theater. Yeah, it takes usually usually it takes a few months. How many months it takes? So, um, um, yeah, please, Alan. I mean, 
what I would say is since George Floyd uh, was murdered, any uh, person of colour working the arts had to either work very, very fast or turn down a lot of work. So in the year that George, as I said, I wrote three operas, but also I was, I had to write, a, I had to arrange something for the last night of the proms and I had, I had three weeks, I was given three weeks to do it. So I'm, I am a very quick person, but I know that um, um, sometimes commissions are set up uh, and if you're not careful, they're set up so that you can fail. And, you know, I, because I'm a very experienced composer, I sort of, I know the things to take on, I can do quickly. But I mean, when I started out as a composer, I would speak to my peers and, and I remember people saying things like oh yes I, I think I'll write one or two big works a year and in fact I'll just do one work a year one orchestral piece a year and I'll give up my performing but I remember thinking you know I have a lot of time to make up for not not least for my ancestors so I I do things at a d different rate to people but it, something I can opt for honestly gestation alone can take years you know decades um but sometimes, you know, I found over these last few years, I haven't had, um, I've had to produce work very quickly. I don't know, I don't know how I've done three operas in a year and two of those were 90 minutes and the other one was an hour long. But I did it because actually there were stories that I just had to tell and I had to find a way of doing them. But normally, I mean, I could have said, sorry, I just can't do this. I need four years. I mean often a composer will take four years but they might be on a private income is all I'd say <laughs> but it's um I feel I feel this burning desire to to tell these stories they need to be told and as many of us as possible need to be telling them but I do see a mismatch with sometimes the commissioning um particularly recently um it's so easy for creatives not to be given enough time it is a problem I mean, thank you, Aralyn. And and uh, uh, I think the question of time is is an interesting one. You ask how much, and the answer is I don't know. And sometimes a uh, time might be a lifetime. I mean, arguably, um, the gestation period for learning about collaboration and ethical collaboration is a lifetime long. Um, I think what I'm I'm trying to say is it's not about short termism. Um, it's not about something that is a couple of days or a conf a single conference um, or a couple of weeks or a project that lasts three or six months or even a year. It's much, much longer to have integrity. It's much deeper than that. And it's about building relationships over time. I mean, um, just thinking about the documentary, it just comes to mind. It's not related, but it is sort of with... Um, my background is in sociology and I grew up with the um, documentary series seven up and you look at Michael Apted, I think it was, who was the documentary maker who made those films. He made them across the lifetime of the people. Not everybody stayed the distance. Um, I think they'd got up until some of the people were in their sixties um, and Apted died uh, a few years ago. So that collaboration is decades long it depends on the work doesn't it um and it depends on you and Marilyn as you were saying you know you you produce fast but the thing that I also uh hear and know of of you is that you are um was mentioned at the top 22 operas you're in immensely experienced and knowledgeable and I was as you were talking I was thinking about Toni Morrison's um, art of fiction essay about the jazz musician and um, I'm paraphrasing here but she talks about reservoirs of knowledge and she says one of the skills unique skills of the jazz musician is to play thrift as luxury and what she means by that is the jazz musician might play a fragment a tiny piece of something but behind that tiny piece of something are reservoirs our libraries of knowledge that lead to that point and that's what I hear when you talk Erilyn is that behind the three uh, uh, operas two of which are 90 minutes that you wrote in the last year are years of experience of honing craft of reading books of traveling of talking to people of 
all all the positional experience that you, that you have, they're behind that. It's never just about the moment. It's about what's behind the moment. And what I would say as well, in that um, in, in that intense year I had, which, believe me, involved staying in my pyjamas most of the year, but I suddenly, I was working with three different teams and I really was reflecting on what we've been talking about, the team, the collaboration, and, and the one that was really the most successful is where everybody, they understood their role, but the trust was so great that people would step out and comment, comment really fruitfully on what somebody else was doing. And the, but there was never any defensiveness. And, you know, it's no accident that all three works were in the pandemic. So died as ghosts. We never, we never had a sing through. We had, and we had one week to get the opera on stage at the Barbican. And the, the Chicago opera, I could only go out there, you know, a week beforehand. And so we were having to rehearse on Zoom. And the same with Grey Eye. Um, but it's the team was at the core of it and and the relationships, the things that you were, um, the things you could say boldly to each other and there would be, it just made the work better. Um, but the, going forward now, I won't write another opera unless I feel the team is really excellent. Thank you. I was going to ask, um... Uh, about that, about the rapidity, really, at which you were composing and then it getting translated onto stage, because uh, the quotation from Jazz Deep at the outset about opera companies with their ways of working since time immemorial and um, putting these things on. Um, did you, you, you mentioned the that some of the collaborations were more successful than others. Is there a sense in which this reservoir of experience that Romy's talking about has to go into the music, has to be embodied in the opera simply because the mechanisms of getting things put on stage and the limited time made available works against it? And so really uh, the product in itself the opera in itself has to communicate these values because the production doesn't have that process time to really disseminate am i i hope i'm making some sense here i just um yes i think you are um so in the case of dido's ghost we were trying to get that on stage for 10 years and we got the green light something like seven months before <laughs> opening but so wesley stace is a singer songwriter and a novelist uh, Freddie Wake Walker as a director I've worked with, you know, writing children's opera Mahogany. And then um, John Butt, um, you know, just a great conductor. But we just all, we we just, it's like we just, it was hit go and we just went. Do you know what I mean? And there never seemed to be any, somehow there's no tension, there was pressure. And actually in the middle of it, the day before, I remember, the day before the dress rehearsal, I actually went over to Abbey Wood to, to work with Sonia Boyce for her installation for Venice Biennale. And I was thinking, how could I do that when, I, when, I, when we've got this up? But it's because that team was so great. You could, it was, it was phenomenal. And, and the pressure made us greater somehow. And of course we had great singers and instrumentalists, but um, I wouldn't let you, but maybe, maybe it's because we had, Maybe behind that, as one was saying, there was this 10 years of thinking with Wesley and I thinking about what we would do. Maybe it was that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had a question from the audience and from Yashin Luo talking about uh, language again, coming back to the notion of language and it's um, the ways in which artistic languages um relates to culture and um so the question asks um what's your opinion on the uniqueness in terms of its approach and function of music um composition in terms of staging ethics and decolonizing compared to the written word or visual arts body movement is there something specific to music here um does it work how um i guess we've talked about collaboration in terms of individuals and people but of course we've got artistic collaboration in terms of the way different media can come together 
or not. So do you feel um, either of you or what are your thoughts on the specific role perhaps that music plays in this conversation? I think Erin and I should hand to you first. Do you know that's such a fascinating question um, because we come up against this idea of uh, it's not just music but the practices of music. So when I was doing Dido's Ghost there was there's the convention of baroque string playing and then me wanting to bring basically North African sensibility but also there's one place where we're playing essentially 70s funk within within the baroque. So I have to find a way of notating forms that maybe hitherto weren't notated and get, getting them down. Um, and that's, I think that's a joy for me of, of doing that and the hope that if people don't necessarily um, know, because the performance practice of, of any music is just so so vast, do you know what I mean? How, how can you suddenly get everybody just to go through all the 70s and know how to, no, I have to find a way of writing that so that it will just appear. Um, but my job as a composer is just to to be around, I suppose, different sorts of musicians. But it it's quite, yeah, uh, life is so interesting. I write music. And then how do you get a, a performer from a whole different tradition to play something in a completely different way, but but in a convincing way, um, especially in regards to stage work? And of course, that bringing musicians in brings another layer of relationship and collaboration and trust and giving the trust to the musicians and the agency to make their interpretative decisions as well. This was something that um, we touched on in previous seminars, just talking about the musicians from the different traditions and the embellishments that they brought to Orpheus. Um, so thank you. Um, so we've covered... Can I come back to that question as well? Sorry, sorry, Rami. Yes. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Erilyn. Um, I'm going to come at it from a, a, a words perspective. So I grew up, um, so from the age of, of 14, I joined the Bristol Black Writers, which is where I grew up. And I was performing in open mic events before I was aware of I me. Mean, now, if you are growing up, you'll be aware that there's probably some kind of slam or um, performance base, you know, Apples and Snakes, for instance, um, that, that is uh, uh, curating spaces for young voices or voices to be heard in terms of poetry and live performance. Well, there wasn't that then uh, when I was younger. So I joined, I and I'm incredibly fortunate to have had that experience. I joined the Bristol Black Writers when I was 14. And so I come up the notion of ethics and decolonization and words through um, specifically spoken word and through poetry and live performance. And, um, you know, the phrase that people will be very familiar who move in those circles is the notion of speaking truth to power and the idea that one of the things that you get by being in live performance with spoken word, word is that you it's like the power of the politician. You get to speak to an audience. You get immediate feedback. You you write and you are engaging with the audience. And the audience is absolutely fundamental to, I mean, it is anyway in any kind of performance, but you really see it. And indeed, depending on the open mic or performance spaces that you enter, the audience will click or they will make certain noises with their feet or vocals. And it's all about a call and response between the audience, the perform. So in those kind of senses, um, the decolonizing in those spaces is A, I can come good and turn up with whatever it is I want to see within reason and perform it on the stage at the mic or in live performance, but also the audience is not silent those spaces challenge the notion that the audience and I think it's often a metaphor for me the audience sits in the dark largely in performance and we expect that they have epiphanies inside the darkness but unless we're doing any kind of community engagement with them we don't know what they think um we go off into the night or into the day 
and they have had this experience that we might not know anything about. But there's a metaphor here that feels so stuck that they sit in the darkness. We have a cultural system of the audience sits in the dark to to experience this performance via which they supposedly have epiphanies and need transformed. But we don't know what that's about necessarily. And we live in a culture that doesn't necessarily engage people often. Um, as it's got a funding report to write in actually what they think about the experience that they've had. Whereas I think what happens within open spaces and with poetry performance spaces is that the audience is A, vital uh, in the sense that we need to know what they think. That clicking and whooping and noises that they make are about the aesthetics of the space. Um, it's about people responding in the moment to what they hear a performer do. And often I've seen in some cases where performers can come in with actually what isn't a great poem, but they can do, they can create a performance that is spellbinding by their ability to relate to the audience and to be able to conjure uh, just a sense of warmth and rapport with an audience. And for me, that's all about um, challenging perhaps structural power dynamics within within live performance. Thank you. There's a very powerful point there that actually audience reactions are often found out after the event um, and less so understanding the diverse communities that whose stories might being represented by these newer forms or indeed uh, represented in the older forms. With, um, there seems to me to be less engagement with communities before an event and getting those sorts of conversations going. And we're talking about the ways in which the collaborative process can extend beyond the creative personnel and the institutions and going out. So um, how, as artists, have you witnessed um or experienced um these sorts of wider community engagements in order to understand these perspectives prior to the event yeah um a, a memorable experience for me is um i wrote an uh, a touring up a small touring up for a Welsh National opera uh, and it was an adaptation of manon but I'd wrote, uh, you know, written the text and music myself. But we, I did a lot of going around schools and colleges. It, it, it was about um, exploitation of young women across, you know, across the world. And I spent, I remember spending some time with um, uh, with sex workers. But also the, the most, uh, it, it sort of changed my life really. A, a day with young Muslim women, and I was asking. I, we were playing this game of, um, you know, situations. What would you do in that situation? If what would you do? It was just an exploring things through drama, and and, and at the end of it, um, every person said, "How can we? How can we get into opera? We want to write an opera because we understood from the inside. We were taking this, um, you know, nineteenth century story and trying to bring it into our world. But that this idea of storytelling, you can get so." The storytelling itself can be a co collaborative thing, um, but that also it showed me that opera is this living, breathing thing. If you just ask questions, you know, and so I was clear. I was thinking, what I have to put in the story are some of the things I've learned. That some things before when we were developing um, with the director, we were workshopping with that actors and I was mixing actors with, with singers and there's one storyline and um, the director said no this can't be true take it out so I took it out you know and then later when I was speaking with um, um, sex workers they said oh no this is absolutely true so I, I believe you you have to involve any story you're telling you have to go to primary sources that's my that's my modus operandi Yeah, that absolutely um, resonates. And thank you very much for that example. And um, again, it's back to the word that I used about consultation and treating people and valuing people as consultants to a process. And uh, I think collaboration in my own experience of it, if I think sort of across the last 10 years, I've 
I've been involved in kind of community performances where I was the script writer for a community performance where we work the, the people in the community with the performers. So and it were the the script was based on their stories around a particular theme. So there was a whole of R and D for several months working with those performers who some of whom had never performed at all uh, before to an audience and. and it involved an interview process and um you know it would involve me as a writer observing the rehearsal process but also interviewing people one-on-one -on -one. and interviews as a method is something that I use all the time I used it prior to beginning a PhD um I've used it since and the thing I'm working on that which I can't talk about at the moment quite yet in detail is that I'm working on a new uh, a piece which um um is a collaboration with um I can talk about this Roderick Williams and that piece uh is involving me I've already done I think 15 interviews with people specific people to give me different vantage points upon a particular subject and I'll be referring to those in the text that I write that will be sung and yeah so it's there Absolutely. And I couldn't do my part role without that consultation. It's absolutely vital to it. It's not a bolt on and it's involved forming and shaping my thinking very much. I also within my own practice as a PhD, well, my PhD was looking at the historical black blues and jazz women and um, the, the legacies of those women and thinking about them in, in a context of civil rights. And so I had the great privilege of interviewing some well, contemporary uh, blues and jazz women. And that, that relates, uh, that, that is um, Cassandra Wilson, Diane Reeves, Terry Lynn Carrington, Esperanza Spalding. So again, and, and I learned so much from those conversations. So it's fundamental, it's, and it's enriching <laughs> and those people are scholars too they are practice-based scholars and that's again I particularly say this academic and the academy has to value people who are bringing embodied when we talk about practice-based knowledge you know there's often a, a, a privileging of um, critical knowledge as in authorized by the academy but a lifetime makes somebody a scholar and somebody might clean for a living, cook for a living, care for a living. They are a scholar of that. They know that. You know, I'm a big fan of the kind of human book concept, the idea that we are each of us books and we host knowledge. And that actually if we borrowed each other's knowledge and listened, listening was used at the top of the conversation. I think listening is so much so important. And um, yeah, I think there are some more questions in the chat, by the way. I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, Romy. Uh, that's a very good example, interviewing two people to get the feedback from the audience. And uh, we have one question from our audience. Yashin uh, would like to ask, could you please share any specific strategy when running intercultural crew? How do you balance the power dynamics such as gender, race, language, and et cetera, uh, among people from different backgrounds? respect has to be at the bottom of it doesn't it, it just has to be cool sometimes I've, I've been in situations where it, there's that top down approach where where a um, institution might put a team together and and some and then maybe there's an expectation of a certain hierarchy and it's come from the top and the best the best uh, co collaborations is when people actually are left to get on to get on with their work one of my happiest times was working with with streetwise where we were were it's just the respect comes from um everybody's imagination and wanting to, wanting to make the work which is a sum of all, everyone you know everybody's imaginations i think that's that's the thing but often that i have been in situations where um some terrible actually situations where i may have been i was commissioned to write a, 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 an opera, which really was, I've been, I've been wanting to write for seven years. And at, and at the center of that were, were um, two black women. And the opera, you know, the theatre said to me, we can't, you, you can't write this as an opera because there were no black um, opera singers in, in England. 
And that was a little bit of a shock. Do you see what I mean? So where I was commissioned to do something and then you realise that actually the very institution didn't, couldn't countenance um, black singers. So then I had to find, I, well, I had to cast myself. I had to find those people myself. But it often, often, and it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes you'll get a shock when you realise um, the the compromise, there's going to be terrible compromise with that team because there's something happening up on high. Their expectations are essentially, you know, um, unequal. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, sorry, I'm slightly bowled over by that story. <laughs> um, Romy, <laughs> Um, Roma, do you have um, experiences yeah. like this? I can talk. Um, Erin, were you going to come back and say something, by the way? No, what I'm saying is I still hold that in my heart. So that happened in 2007. And um, uh, I've been carrying that in my heart. So, you know, what's been welcomed me these last, these last five years. But honestly, that was the attitude from very prestigious institutions. I couldn't believe that somebody could say, could commission one thing for me and then I'm doing it actually at the very heart to negate the presence of you know black artists yeah and that is the disingenuity I mean Sarah Ahmed writes so uh extensively uh, about this and, and beautifully about this the disingenuity of diversity practice is when um it does not have integrity because actually people are not aware of why they're doing it it's kind of become part of tick box culture and the people who are in the receiving end of that know that they feel it they smell it they sense it they know that that's happening so nobody's being fooled when that that happens and um i don't think any whilst the example that you give Ar Erlen is horrible I don't think anybody should be surprised by it uh, because it often happens and often happens too much. And that's when, and when people don't understand the reason for doing something, they don't understand and the politics behind it and actually other things are not in check. Um, I don't know who that institution is or, or was, but, but I think that, um, when I see, but going back to, to, you know, two of the key words around race and ethics, when I see unethical practices. It is often about uh, the people involved not doing their homework on why we're doing this. What is this about um, as a as a journey? I think that um, going back to the question that was asked, which was, please share any specific strategy when running intercultural crew, how do you balance the power dynamics among people from different backgrounds? Well, first of all, people are in the room because of what they do as an art form. Um, those things that you mentioned are in, and of course they are, but they're also there because of what it is that they do as an art form. So that is the primary point of connection. But I think I absolutely agree with Erilyn around respect. Respect has to be there. And we it's also important that when things don't go right, I mean, to slightly different subject, but important, and it does have a relationship to race too. But, you know, the intimacy coordinators that are now a fundamental part or becoming an increasing a part of theatre production and film production, so important because it's about the conversations that, the permission, therefore, that happens within that space for people to be able to relate to each other in a way in which they are protected and supported. And I think about the incredible, incredible work of Amanda Parker and Ink Arts. Um, and I know Amanda's not with the organisation. What she set up there was so important because it was about curating listening spaces where black and brown people who had experienced disgusting <laughs> behaviors and practices within the arts were able to to narrate those and be able to talk about those in a way that was about being heard and so often um so much of what happens the violence of it the administrative violence of it is that somebody is silenced and they are not heard and uh, what that causes you over time to know something is happening and to know that it feels that you 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 can't do anything about that and 
most of all because what the system does is stops you you being heard it silences you and and you no know, that is if you're going to create a space at all it is about trying to curate practices of welcome being heard the organization that i'm involved with brilliant um work that they do so they had within the space that we were working in they had a quiet space that was convened and supported by people who were therapeutically trained and they were with us throughout the 10 days that we were working so we knew they were there if you didn't want to use them you didn't have to but knowing that there was a space that we could be in where people could talk about difficult stuff that was raised is important it's about that thinking ahead of what's needed and uh, yeah respecting people as being as important to you as a space is i think really important in terms of dismantling power systems and structures everybody is important and i think if we work if i want respect then i'm going to give it i think i think that is that is important within the space Thank you so much. Um, I feel we've reached such a crucial point in this conversation, but I'm uh, very conscious of time. So um, I would like to invite our panel, um, if there are any concluding thoughts that anyone would like to make um, before I sum up, um, I would like to give this opportunity. Well, I think we're living in very exciting times and, um, um, you know, talent is abounding and things are changing, you know, we're st- it, but it's, I'd say in the world, say of opera, it we've got a long way to go, you know, I, I but, but things are changing and I'm, I'm very excited to be, you know, alive at this time and working with so much talent internationally. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. And and to to take us to that pitch as we exit, I think is really important because it's about the work. And actually, one of the things I will say, that's another part of company um, and collaboration. Uh, And by the way, throughout my research process, I curated a company, I marked a company, and I take great pride that throughout my PhD process, I paid those people through my professional practice to work with me. And that was about um, countering, I think, what can sometimes happen when the academic uh, institutional world uh, intersects with the communities, it can presume that can work for free because its staff are tenured or they are within the institution and they are supported um, and I know that that's complicated. I know that there are various strikes by staff and I and I hear that. So I'm not glossing over that. But I do think that um, when we are working with the community, we need to think about systems of recompense in terms of the academy and community. That feels very, very important. And, and the way that is, is done is important. And that's because um, it doesn't, it, it always costs something to volunteer, to give time, to be a consultant to something, to contribute in that way. So I, to go back to the point, the things that I have been me healing across time for all the terrible things that sort of are parallel with, with what Erilyn shared have been um, nations of my humanness uh, in terms of those moments that you hit and they are all emotional I sort of feel them in my chest um, and I feel them as hope actually they are and you create something that didn't exist with other people and you go on this journey it galvanizes you and it it mentally and spiritually it's its energy is the place that I want to live. I mean, there's nothing like being inside a studio process or rehearsal process when everything is working with a kind of particular energy and a quality of experience 
experience feels magical and it feels transformational. And I feel um, as a counter to some of the difficult things that we we were just talking about, of which I've experienced far too many of them in my my life. I feel that um, the collaborative work that I'm doing, the projects that I'm engaging with are the counter to, to that. And I feel grateful for them. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. And with an eye on time, I'm going to uh, bring a um, feels like a premature close to proceedings. But I would just like to note that the title of this series, Telling Stor Telling Operatic Stories, um, I think what today's session has done is really demonstrate that the stories around opera and not just the ones on stage, but they're the stories of the personnel involved in staging it, in attending it, in organising it, in marketing it, in thinking about it, in um, preparing stages and places and spaces where opera can happen. And I think today has done much to open up these wider stories as a topic of conversation. And I think it's brought attention to one of the words in our subtitle of the series, authenticity. It's about um, a truthfulness, a respect and integrity in how these stories are gathered, heard and presented. So Erilyn, Romy, thank you so much for your insights and contributions today. Um, it's given us so much food for thought and thank you indeed to all of the audience who have attended. Our next session is going to be on the 8th of December, where we look at operatic stagings of older problematic stories. So thank you all ever so much. And I look forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.